Today, I'm going to be talking about some of the most important things I've learned from my 40 years of working in the music business. Now, if you're starting out in the music business and you're struggling with getting things going, being able to put the amount of time into it that you'd like to, because you're working, don't get discouraged. I spent the first 10 years or more of my career painting houses and doing carpentry work, and I couldn't put in the eight, nine, 10 hour sessions that I like to. So what I ended up doing was making sure that every day I did one small thing, at least one small thing. But you'd be surprised how the cumulative effect of doing one thing every day can add up, just 1% improvement. If you can't put the long hours into it, at least one thing every day and don't stop, build it up. Eventually, if you don't quit, you'll get there. The other thing that I figured out from early on is to not get into debt. And that's actually been a mistake I've seen people make. And I'm going to tell a little story. I had a guy come over to my studio a few years ago, and we were working on some songs. And he was really good. And there was actually a lot of industry attention around him. I was kind of cutting him a deal, but I felt like we needed to do more songs and all that. And I, I knew he, was, he had a job and could afford things. Well, actually, he was, like, he was working like at a sign shop. So it's not like he's making a lot of money. And he was like, well, I don't, I don't really have the money. I don't have the money to pay for this stuff. And it's just too expensive. I was like, oh, bummer. And we walk outside. And this guy had a brand new sports car. And I wish I'd said this at the time, but I remember looking at his car and thinking like, well, there's your album. There's your album and a bunch of promotions and, and videos for the amount of money you're going to be paying for that car, making that payment and your insurance payments every week. Keep your expenses low, even after you have a hit. I've had times in my career where I had a hit song or a really great record or something like that and I made a bunch of money. And hey, next year, you know, my wife's like, hey, you got any work coming in? I'm like, oh, it's up and down, up and down. And that's kind of what saved us. Like after I had done I Never Scared and all the Yin Yang Twin stuff and all that, and I was making a lot of money mixing. We, we bought a small house. We did not buy new cars. But let me tell you, when the business crashed, a lot of my friends lost their homes and studios and all that because they had gone out and bought big houses, which I could have done at the time. But when it crashed, it was great having that smaller house with a lower payment and no, no car payments. And I think that's part of what saved me. It's very important to be good at what you do. Try to be the best at what you do. However, talent alone is not going to get you there. You've got to make sure that you're returning phone calls. Finish the things that you start. Don't let people down. Be professional because no matter how good you are, the things that are going to move you forward are not so much musical things as much as they are letting people know that are investing in you and putting time into you that they're not wasting their time and that it's not all going to go down the drain, which I've actually had happen to me. So no matter how artistic and musical you are, you've still got to be professional. People will stay in terrible situations in their life because they get used to that people that are in abusive relationships, it's hard to get them out of it because as bad as those relationships can be, that's what they're used to. Moving out and going to live with friends or finding a halfway house is something they've never done before. So it's unfamiliar. So it's kind of scary to them. They would actually rather stay in their comfort zone. And I think if you really examine your life, you might find yourself in situations where the reason you're not moving on is because the things that you want, you may want these things, you've never actually done them. So it's just more comfortable staying in your comfort zone. And that's kind of like a weird mind fuck when you think about it. And it's something I've had to check myself on multiple times. Like, do not get stuck in the comfort zone. Like, what can I do? I'm constantly putting myself in situations that I'm not comfortable with because in order to grow, Think about it. In order to grow, you have to go do things you've never done before, which is uncomfortable. Even if you want it, it's uncomfortable because you don't always know the lay of the land. You don't know what, what's going on all the time. So get out of your comfort zone. Don't worry too much about not being good enough. And the reason is, is because there's other people out there that are not thinking about that at all. And they, they are not stopping for a split second to think, am I worthy? Am I good enough? No, they're not even worrying about that. They're just going and doing it. And they're kind of getting in line in front of you. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a situation where I, I knew I wasn't good enough, but I did it anyway. And I may not have gotten the gig or, you know, auditioning for a band or something like that. But I met the people. And sometimes it was humiliating. I've humiliated myself. I don't know how many times because I pushed ahead into something I wasn't ready for. But it helped me learn like, oh, wow, I, I, really, I really need to learn this thing over here. This is something I need to learn. 
don't worry so much about making bad music or bad songs. I know that sounds like a weird thing to say. Like, I think that you can spend so much time concentrating on like making the best song that you actually bypass other ideas that could actually be pretty good. The way that I learned that was more about being a producer. I would start working with a band and I would always tell bands like, well, send me all the songs that you have. Oh, we've already picked out the songs we do. I'm like, yeah, sure, but I want to hear everything anyway. But the thing that happened a lot of times is people would send like, oh, we got this other song. We don't really play it, but I'll send it anyway. And I'd listen to it. I'm like, that's their best song. Their reasons for thinking one of their songs is their best is from their perspective, which isn't always the best thing. Maybe they've been struggling with certain types of rhyme schemes or they just kind of like the new chord progression or whatever. So they're into it. The other thing is most songwriters think the last song they wrote is their best song. So quit taking yourself so seriously all the time. Just write from the heart. Don't worry so much about being good. Just think about being real. When you record something, even if it's a bad recording or you think it's a bad song, don't delete it. Save it. Back it up on a hard drive because everything that you create is an asset. You've got to think of yourself as like a company. Save that stuff. Name it properly. Back it up somewhere because you never know. Things start moving for you. And then you start getting opportunities and people are like, hey, we need a song to license for a movie that sounds kind of like this. And you go, oh, man, I, I had that song I did 10 years ago. I never really finished it. How'd it go again? And, you, you know, if you know where it's at, you can go back and either redo the recording or fix up the recording and, and get it out there. Or somebody just needs somebody's looking for songs for a writer or something like that. Or the other thing that happens, and I've seen this happen with a lot of people, is they get a song out, they start having some success. And what happens is your whole, you know, your whole life leading up to the point where you've had success, you've been able to just kind of focus on the creativity of making your art without a whole lot of outside influence, right? You make that first album that's taken your whole life to get up to the point where you've made your first album. Your second album, you might have a few months or a year to make it. And suddenly the whole situation changes. You've got managers and people at the label or maybe investors and people around you telling you all this sort of stuff. It can get you out of the spot that kind of got you to where you are. So you don't want to be always writing songs from scratch right after you've had a big hit or you've had a lot of success. It'd be good to have some extra songs back there that you can go to and go, oh man, that's actually, that's really, really cool. So save all that stuff, catalog it, even the bad ones, even the bad ones, trust me. Someday you're going to look back and go, oh, there's something in there. That's actually pretty cool. I remember somebody not too long ago was an artist and this artist said to me, well, I just want to make sure that we're being smart. And I'm like, the hell being smart? Like, yeah, but how do you know if you're being smart or not? Sometimes you got to do stuff knowing that it might not be the right thing, but it's better to be doing something than nothing, even if it's not exactly the right thing. Because, hey, who knows? It might be the right thing, but even if it doesn't work out, you're going to learn something from it, as opposed to just sitting back going, oh, God, am I doing the right thing, you know? That's how I learned most of the stuff. I have a tendency to um, just dive in. I'm very gung-ho. So I'll just do stuff. And it's actually a, a, a one of my bad, it's kind of one of my best sides, but definitely one of my worst sides because I tend to jump into stuff where I'm totally ready. But then I learn, you know, and, and luckily I'll bounce back because I, I don't really care. You know, I'll, I'll take a beating. I remember the first time I heard this, it, it was like, huh? It was actually Bob Seger in an interview. And he said, inspiration is for wimps. I was like, what does he mean inspiration is for wimps? You know, like I'm waiting for this, you know, thunderbolt from the clouds to come down and hit my head, which sometimes happens. But he said, if you're waiting around for inspiration, it's going to mess you up because uh, you're not always going to have inspiration. And sometimes you just need to get something done. Sometimes it's just about putting the work in. Get down there and just start doing something. Once again, even if it's not great, do something. And what you'll find sometimes is that if you just start working and start making something, you'll actually find inspiration in the process. Even if it's just everything you do is just like terrible for a week straight, just do it anyway. Because in the process, at least you're getting practice, you might figure out something new technically about EQing something or compressing something or a new reverb or God, who, who knows? Or maybe you're looking online for song ideas and you discover a new song and it's just, you never know. I did an interview with Carly Park who did all the Yin Yang Twin stuff a while back, and he was talking about putting in the work. And he said, man, sometimes I just head down to the studio, even if I'm just sitting there, 
is kind of still putting in the work, even if he has no ideas, even if he's so uninspired that he's just sitting there staring at the wall or the screen. He says, I just go do it anyway. Eventually, I'm going to do something. So don't wait for inspiration. Just just do it and you'll you'll find your way. You'll find your way. It's all about what you create. That's the most important thing. What I've noticed today is that I'll get with a young artist. They've got two, three, four, five songs, whatever. I've mixed a couple. And then all of a sudden you just see them online all the freaking time. And it's like, okay, that's good, but they're not sending me any mixes. And they're not working with the other producers and and they're just spending all their time on social media. And it's like, that's cool, but that should not take away from the creative time because that's that's what it's about. Make sure that most of your energy is going into your actual art. I know it sounds corny. It's like, well, it's all about, it's who you know. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And you know what I say to that? I say bullshit, bullshit. It's about what you can do. I had friends, they're not in the business anymore, that had way more contacts than me. I'd get a phone call. I'm at Usher's house. I'm like, well, I've never been to Usher's house. I'm at so-and-so's house. And these people never, they never really did anything. Why? Because they're spending all their time trying to get into somebody's house and hang out at a party and become friends with somebody. It's like, if you're spending more time doing that than creating, pfft, doesn't matter. The best example I've got about that would be something I saw with Polo de Don. Polo de Don produced um, Throw Some D's and stuff for Fergie and Beyonce and whatever. And I had mixed some songs for Polo at my place in Norcross, the zone. And when he left, he left two hard drives there. And then he was working down. He set up shop at Stonehenge down in Atlanta, which used to belong to Jim Zapano. And I saw those drives like a month later. And I was like, oh, man, those are Polo's drives. So I hit him up. Well, actually, I saw one of the drives. So I called him up and said, hey, Polo, I got one of your hard drives. He's like, oh, bring it on down. Come hang out at the studio. So I went down there and I walk into the A room there. And he's like, He's like wearing like an old T-shirt. He just looked tired as hell. There were literally like clothes laying on the floor. He'd basically been sleeping in the studio. And this is at the time when he was at the height of his career. He was having the biggest hits and all that. You'd think a guy like that, when you get to that level, that you're going to be out at parties and all those events. And 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 he did. I saw him at, a, at an award show once, and he didn't. Co- he actually didn't come in like dressed up like everybody else. He came in in a t-shirt, jeans, walked around, shook hands, was there 15 minutes, and was back out the door. He's probably at some studio. This is out in L.A. So I'm looking at him like, man, this guy's working harder than me. He's like exhausted. He's been up for days and he played me some tracks. They were brilliant. And I gave him the hard drive. And then at some point he goes, Nelly's coming over. And he starts taking these dirty clothes that were laying around. He's like shoving them under the couch, trying to clean up. He's like, oh, he's trying to look for a clean shirt. And then Nelly walks in with his crew and and I left. It was just getting crowded. So I, I go back to my studio, right? Two days later, I saw the second hard drive. I was like, oh God, there's another hard drive. So I hit him up and said, like, I'll bring it on down. He's like, I couldn't get down there. I had people coming over. So I sent somebody down there that was working with me. I said, hey, can you, you, he was with me the last time. I said, hey, drive down to Stonehenge and take this to Polo. So he goes down there, brings the hard drive there. And then when he comes back, he's like, man, Polo was wearing the same shirt. He'd been there this whole time. He'd not left. It was like two days later. He'd been working the whole time. And it was just like, man, the drive and focus on the work. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It is about the work you do. Spend more time creating than networking and social media. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. I've done a few records for a band called the Infamous String Dusters. We won a Grammy a few years ago. When I first started working with them, we were working up at a studio in Asheville, North Carolina called Echo Mountain. It was like the maybe the second or third night there. We'd already accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. I think we're trying to get through two songs because we we record everything live. And we're trying to decide, well, should we move on and start another one or should we just knock it off and just hit it a little earlier tomorrow? And one of the guys like, oh, I think we should go back to the band house because the studio had a band house. Like, we should go back and party and play some songs and jam. But the bass player, Travis Bookie said, I think we should go back and go to sleep. I was like, well, that's boring. So they all left. I had my motorcycle. Instead of driving right back to the house, I thought I'd just kind of drive around for 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes. I just needed to clear my head. So I got back to the house after they'd been there. So when I pull up, they're all inside. I walk inside and everybody was in bed. I'm like, whoa, are these guys supposed to be up partying or something? No, they'd all gone to bed. So, you know, I went to bed. Next day, I called their manager and I told him about that. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the guys have been doing it for years. You know, they've kind of really figured out that this is a marathon, not a sprint. 
he goes on and explains what happens with a lot of bands on the road. And that is bands get out, they start touring and they're just, they're convinced they're going to become stars in a few years. So they get out there and they're hitting it hard, but they're also partying every night. They're just driving ahead. They're not eating well. They're not getting enough sleep. They're also not maintaining their relationships. They're just kind of driving ahead full steam without thinking about it. And after, you know, four or five, six years, they typically burn out. These bands normally break up because they're not looking at the long-term goal here because even after you have a hit song, if you're touring and doing gigs, it's still the same work. You might be flying first class instead of economy, and you might be on a tour bus instead of a van, and you're going to be staying in better hotels, but it's still the same work. It's, it's literally the same amount of hours, and it still means that you have to get enough sleep. It means that you need to eat well. And you can't party every night because for the rest of your life, no matter how successful you are, you're going to have to keep doing the work. And there's also going to be up times and down times. So hold steady. Don't worry what other people are doing. Go at your own speed. And most importantly, don't quit. Your songs are not your children. Now, before I had kids, I used to think that my songs were the most precious thing to me. And I, I understand that they do need to be precious, but you can get carried away with it. I remember situations where people wanted to help me with something or maybe they wanted to do something with a song or whatever, and I would just be clinging it to it so hard and, you know, I, and I, I blew situations. But over time, I started to realize, let me let some of that stuff kind of get into other people's hands and see what happens. And, and the example I have is I had written a song about my dad, but I never could nail the lyrics. And then my buddy, Sky Keaton, who's sung on a bunch of records, he's, he's a friend of mine, and he wrote these beautiful lyrics to the, this hook. And, and, you know, we talked about putting it out. And then because he was out, you know, talking to people and all that, he met this producer who said, I want to use that song for an artist in England. And he came and talked to us and I didn't want to do it because to me it was like, oh, it's why it's our song. But he he had a big wad of cash. And I could have done without the money, but I knew Sky needed the money more than me. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll take it. But I, I felt really like, I don't know, I felt really weird about that. I'd never done that before. So, you know, we signed the paperwork and we we actually and the other thing is we cut this producer in as some of the songwriting, even though he didn't write a damn thing on the song. But since he's gonna, you know, take it to England and do all the stuff he needed to do, and it still wasn't for sure going to be on the album. Like, he was putting his own money up. We cut him in on the publishing. So it was, like, I think split three ways. And I just felt like we got ripped off, right? And then, like, a year later or so, it becomes a top 10 hit in England. The song is called Another Day by an English singer named Lamar. And that's our song. But by the time it came a hit, I'd kind of not forgotten about it, but I moved on to other things. I was like, oh, cool. It didn't feel really bad. And I thought about what I'd written for my dad. I was like, ah, actually, those were terrible lyrics. And, and even though Sky's version was great, Sky was never able to get a deal. Had we held on to that song, it would still be on my hard drive. But it got us further ahead. And it was also a, you know, a feather in both of our caps that we could use to go get more stuff to happen, to let people know that we can make songs that have value to them. You know, if you're good, you can just write another song. Don't worry about it. So remember, your songs are not your children. They're the things that you create and you need to create a bunch of them. So just be, be willing to let go of them once in a while. No excuses. Your excuses don't matter because at the end of the day, the only thing that does matter is what comes out of the speakers. The listener's not there going like, oh, this is cool. And then you're like, yeah, but it would have been better if we'd done da, da, da. None of your excuses, none of the reasons, nobody's going to know about that. And someday you're going to actually forget about all that stuff. 10 years later, you're not going to remember those arguments. You're not going to really remember these stupid relationships. You're not going to remember the jackass producer you're working with or the jackass musician. Trust me, there were situations I was working on. There was some jackass in my way and screwing things up. Now, luckily I can be kind of a jerk. I just kind of ply my way through that stuff and just tell them to go to hell. But in the end, my stuff came out good. And then later on, it's like, oh yeah, there was that guy that was kind of intimidating me. I, you know, you're not going to remember all that. The only thing that matters is what comes out of the speaker. So remember, no excuses. I'm sorry you can make excuses to other things in your life when it comes to this stuff. No excuses. People will hit me up in Instagram or, you know, text messages and they'll say, hey, I'd like to get together with you so we could network. And I was wondering, like, what do you, what are we going to network? Are we like wiring something together? Like, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know who you are. We're gonna get together, and I'm just gonna give you a bunch of fucking phone numbers or something like that. What, what are you gonna do with that? I don't know you. 
or like, oh, let's go to this place and network. We're going to pass out business cards. I've passed out so many business cards and I don't think I've ever gotten any gig from a business card. But I've gotten my work from friends. What I did is I just made friends with people I like. A lot of times what would happen, there'd be somebody I liked, but I, I, we could never hang out because they're busy in the studio and I'm busy in the studio, so I would invent reasons. It's kind of why I got to know Bone Crusher because I liked them so much. We'd met on another project, and then when that project ended, I was like, oh, I want to hang out with Bone. So I just hooked up with him, and I invented reasons for him to come over because I liked him. I didn't think about his networking. I just thought, like, this dude's awesome, and I want to hang out with him. And, and I, I had a feeling he was going to be successful, but... I've felt that way about other people who I didn't like and I didn't, I'm not going to work with somebody I don't like because then if you have success, you got to keep hanging out with somebody you don't like. When you're out trying to meet people, realize that what you're really doing is creating relationships and friendships. The other thing that people get wrong about all that is they they think they can just go out and get some business cards or hand out business cards and that they're going to meet people and these people are just going to be like, they're just going to give them something like, hey, can you listen to my record or can you hook me up with so-and-so? It's like, why the hell would they? They don't know who you are. You need to offer people something. If you're going to go out and, you know, network, what are you offering them? Instead of going out and asking for something, offer them something. And how can you help them? And then it becomes a relationship and it can hopefully become a friendship. And then they'll work with you forever. And this is probably one of the most important things that somebody ever said to me. And that was uh, working with Collie Park, who did all the Yin Yang Twins stuff. I remember one day during a session, he looks at me and he says, anybody will work with you because you just had a hit or you're about to have a hit. Your, your song's going up the charts. But people will work with you forever if they like you. When you're in the business and somebody's had a hit, it's like, oh, maybe I can hook up with them. And you work with them and then you're like, oh, I don't like them. You know, when that song's not a hit anymore and they're not having hits, you, you're not going to take those phone calls anymore. Trust me, I've been in that situation. You, you get to know me like, Ugh. you know, be nice to people. Be a friend. Be a friend. Managers. As you're coming up in the business, it's like, oh, I need a manager. Uh, maybe not. Here's my experience with managers. In most cases with younger artists, if they say, I've got a manager, my first thought is, oh, pfft. well, that's the end of their career. I mean, seriously, until you're up at a pretty good level, you're probably not going to get a good manager. And even then your manager can destroy your career. I think that usually happens because people, artists especially, they don't want to deal with the business stuff. Like, I just want to be creative. It's like, I get that. But if you take your eye off the ball and just hand it to somebody and you don't understand what's going on, they can screw it up really bad, which is normally what happens. My advice is don't spend your time looking for a manager. When you're ready, the right manager will find you or or maybe the wrong manager, but there'll be managers, you know, looking to work with you and they'll be hitting you up. But if you've handled it yourself up to that point, you've been like dealing with your bookings and your money and promotions and your brand and all, all that stuff you got to do. By the time managers start hitting you up, you're going to have a really good idea what they're supposed to do. And which one is the right one for you? Because you could meet somebody who managed a big star that had a huge hit. That doesn't mean they're going to do a good job managing you. I've seen that multiple times. Like, oh, I got this person. They managed so-and-so and and blah, 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 blah. But that didn't, they didn't do a good job for this person. So just because somebody was a manager had success doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Manage yourself. Take care of that in just as long as you can until you get offers. And then they're going to know whether that person is right for you or not. You're going to actually understand what they do. And also remember, the manager works for you. The manager works for you. You're always the boss. You should think of the manager as like a really intelligent assistant, a really driven, smart assistant. At the end of the day, the decision needs to come from you. Understanding contracts. You need to learn how to read contracts. You should definitely have a lawyer, but you should always read your own contracts. So when they're discussing it, the lawyer is talking about something, you can at least look down and follow along because they're, trust me, when you get a lawyer, they're going to say, well, uh, uh, in section two, paragraph C, number two, blah, 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 blah. And you could sit there like an idiot and go, but you need to actually understand what they're talking about because in the end, all the lawyer is going to do is advise you and make suggestions. You have to make the decision. You'll see this in contracts sometimes. It's uh, notwithstanding heretofore. Who here knows what that means? Notwithstanding heretofore. You could have a 20-page contract that lists out 
everything. Oh, like you're going to have creative control. You're going to get this much percentage, blah, blah, blah. All the stuff that looks good to you. At the end of that contract, there could be a paragraph and it starts with notwithstanding heretofore. And then they can lay out a bunch of stuff, which basically overrides everything else that was said in the contract, more or less. I mean, it's a, a little more complicated than that, but they're basically saying, regardless of what was said before, this has precedent. But if you don't know what that means, you're like, oh, I don't know. You might, ah. Trust me, boom, that's how they get you. They, and it's usually in the last paragraph. So le learn what these legal terms mean. Read the contracts. If you don't understand something, look it up. Learn about contracts. Sign song splits. So in case you don't know what a song split is, when you write a song with people, you're going to divide up the ownership of the song. That's the intellectual property. And everybody has a different way of doing it. You know, like in the hip hop world, it's kind of like often the person that makes the beat gets half the song, which seems kind of crazy to me, but that works out that way a lot. And then the person, the guy who writes the hook gets a percentage and all that. In Nashville, it tends to be split equally between all the people who are in the room at the time the song was written, which actually makes a lot of sense to me. It just simplifies things. And then it can be whatever. You know, one guy gets 20%, one person gets 40%. That's fine. Whatever it is, make sure you sign that piece of paper. Because no matter how good that vibe is in the room, if it turns into something that's generating money and you've not worked this out, you guys might have talked about it, but if it's not on paper, trust me, once money's involved, oh, that person that was your best friend or you thought was really cool, they're going to be like, oh, I thought I was getting 47%. There was one song, I don't want to say who it was, but it was one of the people I worked with and they had a huge hit song and they'd somehow forgotten to do the song splits. So they were like at like 101%. And they argued about that extra 1% for like months. So all the money was held in escrow. I mean, that 1% was worth a lot of money, but we're talking about, you know, people that would know better that had worked on hit songs. So do some song splits. I've got some song splits up on my Discord server. If you want to get on my Discord server, they're there. I am not a lawyer. Download them. You use them. That's just your responsibility. Don't come back to me. But these are standard song splits. There's three different types. I mean, you can always write your own. Hell, write them, on a, write them on a napkin and sign your names. But you can use these forms too. But they're on my Discord. We've got some other free stuff up there if you want them. Regarding like recording contracts, and this is something I think most people figured out by now, but if somebody's offering you money, especially if it's in a recording contract, remember that money is not free. That is a loan with terrible terms. And the expenses are typically going to be paid back by you out of your small damn percentage of the earnings. So you got to pay back that advance and all the expenses, which I think is a scam, but that's the way the system works. So nothing's free. You know, you get some investors, it's not necessarily set up as a loan, but that means that they might own some stuff. So be very careful about people offering you money. I know that you need money and all that, but even from relatives, hmm, um, not me personally, but I've worked with people who got money from relatives and it ended up being <laughs> it's like terrible. Try to do it on your own as much as possible. And the other thing is about publishing deals. Publishing deals are can be a great thing because sometimes you need the money. It's a good way to kind of like focus on what you're doing, uh, you know, or focus on what you want to focus on for a while and take the pressure off some other stuff. But I will tell you this, pretty much every single person I've ever met who got a publishing deal ended up regretting it or, or hating it at some time. Because the way a publishing deal works is they'll give you some money and that'll get paid back out of, you know, f future royalties that you might make off the songs. But the way they work is that you're in that contract until you fulfill the obligation. So let's say you sign a publishing deal for, I don't know, 20 songs, right? You have to supply 20 songs that are going like on, you know, major releases or artists that have major releases. That doesn't mean that you wrote on 20 songs. That means that you have 100% what would equal 20 songs. So uh, think about it this way. Let's say you write a bunch of songs and you, you're getting 50%. That means you'd have to do 40 songs because you have to get up to that, what would be 100% on 20 songs. I, I, I'm sure this isn't the truth in all cases, but in a lot of cases is the way it works. So educate yourself about how the publishing deals work. Learn how to read a contract. Learn how your particular deal is structured and really think hard. Is it worth the money? Because they're going to take a lot of your earnings in the future. And in the long run, it may not be worth it over the years. Well, that's all I got for now. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe. Uh, come to my Wednesday afternoon live streams at 3 p.m. And always be unique.